Corn and soybean stumbling down after the USDA report. The expert to comment on that is ready. Is Jerry Goodell right here on Connected Farmer, or your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. So Jerry, uh, we had uh, higher stocks than expected for soybeans. Uh, w w what are you seeing on this report? Yes, uh, the, the soybeans were about 30 million or so higher. They did uh, uh, come up with a slightly uh, revised higher uh, old crop number there on beans. But uh, exports uh, and uh, crush looks like they're going to be about as anticipated previously. The big uh, unknowns or the big changes that happened today were both in wheat and and, and uh, the crop size for this 2022-23 year. Uh, and also the uh, final carryover stock on corn was about uh, 133 million less than expected. Uh, that kind of uh, follows some of my logic of last week when I talked about the fact that Wheat usage uh, this year uh, on feed could easily be reduced because of the high prices and that the, we probably, possibly at least actually utilize some higher levels of corn uh, for feed in the Southwest. And that's uh, really the, the, the big factor why both of those numbers uh, uh, were an impact there. The, the, uh, the feed usage... Uh, uh, didn't really go down because of the price. It went down because there wasn't uh, as much supply out there. Yes. And uh, what do you think uh, is going to be the impact of, of this report for the U.S. farmer in a context where the U.S. dollar is stronger as well? So that becomes a little more dramatic. Well, I think the the particularly in the wheat here, when we ended up... Uh, it took about 130 plus million uh, supplies out. And it was a combination of both Southern Plains, Hard Red, uh, which is where the we talked about the cattle usage was, uh, cattle feeding usage was down uh, and that partly because it wasn't there. And also it was reduced up in the spring wheat areas when they had reduced seedings and uh, harvested area there. The wild thing was that uh, uh, I didn't even pick it up till a friend called and said that there was a uh, over a million acres uh, less uh, uh, harvested here in the U.S. And that was part of the reason why this, these yields, uh, along with yield, uh, the, excuse me, the production was down and the yields were off also slightly. But that's a significant factor. And uh, when it comes to uh, U.S. dollar and its impact on grains, it's really it's highlighted in the wheat crops because there is so many places that you can uh, raise wheat. Uh, and that uh, around the world, uh, and that uh, the the dollar relationship uh, to other currencies, and we are at historic highs, about twenty year highs. We're not as as high as, as we were uh, back in the eighties when we were at, uh, up at one hundred and twenty in the so called uh, dollar index. We're only in the one hundred and fourteen dollar uh, relationship, but even then, uh, this is. Um, it, it makes it a little tougher to sell uh, wheat uh, from the U.S. Uh, when the, that's a factor in there. And it's a factor in, in corn and soybeans, too. I'd have to say, though, in soybeans, uh, the uh, cost of uh, moving things and also this, this, the protein values uh, around the world, uh, it, it doesn't have as much impact uh, as we go through here is in that corn, it's uh, definitely a factor at times, uh, depending on uh, South America can get it, get something to go in here. The weather down there, uh, and it just happened to be noted to the last few days here is that uh, there's a strong possibility they might in Argentina potentially lose half a million hectares of harvested uh, area down there because of the dry weather that continues to impact uh, uh, that country. And I, I think at this point, it's even delayed uh, corn plantings down there. Uh, beans are traditionally not planted until later in the fall, closer in November, December. 
Yes, and from the speculator point of view, I think that soybeans become more attract attractive with these prices and also with all this talk about a stronger La Nina in Brazil. Those are definitely good long-term ideas and to, to keep people uh, connected here. The, the situation, uh, because of what we've just started to experience here in Argentina, and the, last year we had a pretty significant impact of La Nina, and this is going to be the third year in a row. All the meteorologists in the world keep telling us it's going to be around till January or February, and that last year we had a significant impact in the southern uh, producing areas there of, uh, of Brazil, Paraná and Rio Grande do Sul, uh, and also Mato Grosso do Sul. All those uh, areas uh, had a pretty significant setback in, in their output. And if that happens again, this uh, there's been a lot of talk that we're going to be planting or producing a crop out here of uh, 150 million metric tons. Uh, and last year there were expectations of 135 to 145 million, and all we ended up getting was 126. Uh, so uh, definitely something to keep in mind. I think that the world is still going to be uh, still watching world weather situations. Uh, in in La Nina is one of these uh, amazing situations that hits the western half of the U.S. and Argentina and southern Brazil and uh actually surprisingly it's a good one for australia they're a el nino uh, uh part of the world when you have uh, that phenomenon but that isn't the case for australia and uh, what are you going to be observing next week well next week is going to be a uh, uh interesting one uh the uh of course we're going to continue to keep uh, quite an eye here on uh, the black sea uh, and what's going on over there. And, you know, it's all because of uh, President Putin's uh, interesting referendum here that uh, seemed to have 95% uh, uh, approval of his uh, taking over four different provinces of Ukraine, which I think nobody in the world thinks is uh, really what, uh, what the people of that part of the world wants. And uh, that really does suggest that the potential for this uh, are uh, the current food corridor to continue gets less and less uh, at this point uh, from there. And so that's a big factor that we're going to keep an eye on at this point. Of course, uh, what how the weather uh, impacts some of the uh, planning situations in Brazil as well as uh, Argentina. And uh, that there's been just a modest start here. I think there's like two or three percent at this point. Uh, from there, but there does seem to be some showers around in Mato Grosso, so that should be positive. The 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 twist uh, in, in the U.S. of course is uh, that uh, the U.S. dryness is continuing here with the hurricane that came uh, through Florida and up now up through the southeast. Really, it doesn't look like it's going to have any impact in uh, on uh, any late season situations in the Midwest. And so um, I feel like that's uh, a situation that we're going to continue to watch our U.S. yields. I've heard some good yields in Illinois and, and, and uh, Iowa, but I've also heard some poor ones in, uh, in definitely uh, parts of Iowa, the southern part of the state, and also up in the northwest. And so uh, uh, right now, at least, uh, the uh, soybean situation uh, it's going to be, like you say, one to keep a close eye on. These are uh, the interesting thing we've uh, found is, you know, a, a number here of carryover stock for old crop uh, that was higher than expected. But we're starting out with a 200 million number on last month's uh, U.S. yield. So um, uh, all of a sudden, this this extra t uh, 30 million is going to make it at 230. Well, 230 is still a very, very small number. So uh, we're going to be... Uh, Watching uh, the uh, world's uh, uh, yield prospects here in the U.S. and and also the world tensions as we step into the first week in October. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day, sir.